Majority Report with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. <laughs> And I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Thursday, April 20th, 2023. <laughs> My name is Emma Big Linden for Sam Cedar, and this is the five time award winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, Michael Sandel, professor of government theory at Harvard University, author of Democracy's Discontent, a new edition for our perilous times. Meanwhile, the Supreme Court has asked for extra time to rule on Mifepristone access, which doesn't seem like a good sign. Friday's the estimated deadline, meaning they might try to dump some news on that Friday afternoon. The distributor of genetic, generic mifepristone has sued the FDA to protect the drug if SCOTUS overturns its approval. Harlan Crow wasn't just paying off Supreme Court justices with weird gifts and property. The New Republic found that he donated cash to the centrist group No Labels as well. In better Supreme Court news, they've sided with Texas death row prisoner Rodney Reed, allowing him to continue pursuing DNA evidence that could exonerate him. Three charged in this weekend's deadly shooting in Alabama. An autopsy of Cops City protester Tortuguita shows that they were shot 57 times by police. Cinema and Mark Kelly appear to be joining Joe Manchin's efforts to sink Julie Sue's Labor Secretary nomination, despite approving her as Deputy Labor Secretary two years ago. As expected, Biden has rejected McCarthy's initial debt ceiling proposal, which would cut climate SNAP and IRS funding. Speaking of that IRS funding, it has increased enforcement and raised the Treasury an extra $108 billion this tax cycle. More members of Congress have been caught trading stocks amid March's bank failures, including New York Representative Dan Goldman, the guy that beat out Yulene New in my district, and the wife and kids of Ro Khanna. Hmm. SpaceX's Starship rocket took off this morning and proceeded to explode in midair. Elon was there. Why would you post my assassination coordinates? House Republicans are set to pass a bill today that would ban trans women and girls from female sports. Female athletes like Megan Rampineau have written a letter vehemently disapproving of it. Florida State Board has approved DeSantis' expansion of Don't Say Gay to all grades. A semi-automatic weapons ban has passed the Washington State Legislature. And lastly, the Oklahoma County Commissioner, who was recorded discussing lynching black people and killing reporters, has resigned. All this and more on today's Majority Report. Welcome, everybody. I am feeling refreshed from my time off. Appreciate all the kind words about my birthday on Tuesday. It was really nice just to kind of step back. I heard I missed a pretty uh, pretty fun call yesterday. Happy not to be in for that. <laughs> fun is an interesting way. Of I mean, uh, uh, fun is not the right adjective. You're right. I could use some others. I, I haven't heard it yet, but I've, I've heard descriptions of it to, uh, to me. But... Um, yeah, freaking freak writes in. The real host is back in the saddle. Hell yeah, hell yeah. 
Um, no, but it's good to have Sam back. We're hopefully getting Matt back soon. So slowly we're piecing the crew back together. Um, and we'll, we'll be uh, bringing you our regular scheduled program as soon as next week, most likely. But I mentioned this at the start of Headlines. The Supreme Court has delayed its decision on the insane Mifa Pristone case out of Texas where a Trump appointed judge essentially copy pasted conspiracy theories from the plaintiffs about the efficacy and safety of Mifa Pristone, which underwent extensive FDA testing multiple times over the average period for a drug um, of that nature because it de deals with abortion. And in this country, there's a huge constituency that wants to limit abortion, as we know. Um, it's safer than Tylenol. There's no questions about the efficacy and safety of mif mifepristone. And that is kind of the underbelly of why drug manufacturers are through a lawsuit saying to the FDA, you better not listen to this if they choose to limit the abortion pill, the Supreme Court does, because, hey, this is a one time where we're happy to have big pharma on our side here because their profits are threatened by this. And if they were to limit this pill, the generic version of the drug would be undercut due to labeling practices as laid out by the FDA. So glad to have them on our side. I think that the drug manufacturers and their influence is why you hear people like Nancy Mace, who is a Republican, continuously kind of trying to pump the brakes on the Supreme Court and their out of control right wing activism on this front. Um, first in the Dobbs decision and now potentially here if they choose to strike some sort of, quote, compromise position. Because, one, I mean, for Republicans, this is really bad electorally. We sh saw that their anti-trans panic did not hold water when voters were faced with fundamental rights for people who can get pregnant being taken away in this midterm election cycle. She probably feels under threat, Nancy Mace. And also the fact that Big Pharma's like, uh, uh, hey, you listen to us, Republican Party, and, and we don't like this at all. Here she is um, on C-SPAN reiterating her position that, uh, honestly, the the Judge Kaczmarek decision should just be ignored. I oppose the decision. It was a hand-picked case with a hand-picked judge. And this is a drug, this drug, it's not just an abortion pill. It is a medication that is FDA approved. It's prescribed by doctors for women who are also suffering miscarriages who want to avoid having to have surgery. Um, it's also used in cancer treatments. It's used for rare diseases like uh, Cushing's disease. And so there's a larger part of the story here. And the other side of it, too, is that this activist judge, unelected judge, made this decision and turned it into basically a federal ban at that point, but this uh, unelected judge shouldn't be making decisions about FDA approved medication that went through this process 23 years ago, but he used as the basis for his decision, at least in part, a law called the Com Comstock Act from 1800 something that was ruled unconstitutional by the U.S. Supreme Court in 1983. And so the basis for his ruling was entirely unconstitutional. And I think, you know, we've got to make that delineation here. And the other thing that I want to say about that ruling is that when President Trump was president, there were plenty of Republicans that wanted to ignore activist judges when they ruled against President Trump. And so it shouldn't be a surprise that that, that someone on either side wants to ignore a, a ruling that they disagree with. And, you know, that's that's the way this goes. And I want to be a strong voice for common sense and for finding that middle ground. Well, the, the concern here about the middle ground approach and everything there that Nancy Mace said is is pretty irrefutable. Uh, I would not conflate people choosing to ignore decisions related to uh, or people in the Trump administration choosing to ignore judicial decisions with the 
culmination of a multi-decade right-wing well-funded extremist effort on abortion um and ignoring that clearly unconstitutional ruling because the, the, the those two things are not the same but um when she says compromise that is not the best and she's a republican so this is why but that's not the best path forward because the Kasmeric decision was appealed to the extremist activist fifth circuit and they struck a quote compromise position which essentially limits mifepristone the abortion pill and puts restrictions on it that would only allow it to be used in the first seven weeks of pregnancy currently it's 10 weeks going against again this well-documented fda authorization that went through extensive questioning and they landed on this that week period through scientific research and the most cumbersome element that was proposed by the fifth circuit is that it would require three in-person doctor's visits instead of just getting it over telehealth which is now an increasing kind of way for people to get access to health care if they they don't have the time say they're working two or three minimum wage jobs say they even have the ability to go to a doctor so we already don't have a uh equitable health care system in this country to put it mildly a lot of people don't have the ability to see a doctor at all and now what the fifth circuit is proposing is three doctor's visits how can people have the time how can people afford that but obviously that's the point so i really don't like saying we're going to strike compromise on here um this is a preview of what the supreme court does want to do they want to undercut the administrative state and say well you guys have made these independent determinations about the usage of mifepristone out through scientific rigor we actually don't give a crap about that and we want to make the decisions for you this is the definition of judicial activism when they're going to be like eh, i don't think i agree with 10 weeks we're gonna we're gonna do seven we're gonna do seven and eh, telehealth not one in-person doctor's visit not two but three like, this is the role that the legislature is supposed to be playing in our constitutional system. But the judiciary has decided it's our it's our job to write the rules. And I love how they're just completely scrapping the state's rights arguments here, the Fifth Circuit. Like, nah, just let, let's cherry pick this. Let's find, let's, hey, Kazmarek, this total psycho, has set, uh, planted his flag here. The FDA has planted their flag here. And it's our job to strike a middle ground. No, it's not. No, it's not. It's your job to decide what is legal and what isn't. But, I mean, to, to, to expect the Supreme Court to abide by its constitutional kind of guardrails is hilarious at this point. So I don't even know why I'm going down that road. But the point is just that they're so, so far gone that this is what's being entertained at this, at this point. So um, at the same time, though, Look at what is happening on the state level. <laughs> like, this is what you people need to understand. Nancy Mace is, on, is a uh, member of Congress on the federal level. She's a representative looking out for her own interests. And the problem with being a Republican and trying to do that is that they want to have it both ways. They want to represent the drug manufacturers. They also want to have electoral success and, and, and maintain their power by not having any anti-abortion backlash, uh, or an any backlash to abortion restrictions, I should say. And then at the same time, this is the base that they cultivate. These are the groups that they listen to. This is a Cincinnati right to life leader, Nancy Streitman speaking at the Ohio state legislature about a 10 year old girl who went out of state to get an abortion. This is how these psychos think. She cried and begged for a little sister or a baby. And while a pregnancy might have been difficult on a 10 year old body, a woman's body is designed to carry life. That is a biological fact. A it is girl. not designed to have disgusting death instruments remove her preborn child from her womb. Both situations would be difficult. But we know for a fact that every single time life wins. And that, again, is a statistical fact. It's a terrible, tragic situation. And we must do better to protect children 
from that kind of a difficult situation that allows such heinous, horrible abuse. And I'm sorry the rapist did not, the abortionist did not report the rape, and I'm sorry that the mother permitted this. <laughs> An effort to have things that are accurate on this record in this very distinguished body in these halls where laws are made. That is simply untrue. It was reported. So let us not continue to spread disinformation time and time again about certain families' personal issues that they have dealt with in terms of a 10-year-old rape victim being raped and child sexual abuse. I take extreme offense to that on behalf of the family and the poor 10-year-old who is subjected in that, in that way to being the poor 10-year-old who is subjected in that, in that way to being raped at such a young, tender age. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> to put it mildly, I appreciate the pushback. Um, I mean, that's it. She says a woman's body is designed to carry life. Yeah. Not every woman. There are women who can't get pregnant, cis women. And that doesn't make them any less of a woman, you psycho. And a 10-year-old is not a woman. A 10-year-old is a girl. And there are well-known health ramifications for underage pregnancy, especially at the age of 10. At the age of 10. And in the United States, I heard the statistic uh, this morning when I was listening to Democracy Now! People are 14 times more likely to die from carrying a pregnancy to term than from an abortion. 14 times more likely to die in this retrograde nation where we're way down the list at the bottom in terms of quote unquote first world countries with infant mortality we are at the bottom we're near or at the bottom 14 times more likely to die from a pregnancy than from an abortion especially an abortion with a drug like mifepristone in early weeks of pregnancy when it is well documented that the abortion pill is 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 very effective i mean it, it just nancy mays can say all she wants on the national stage but on the local level these are the people that are pushing for this kind of extremist position and that's why the construction of a compromise is harmful you beat these people you don't compromise with them because as we saw, Dobbs was supposed to be the compromise. States' rights, bring it to the states. And now, within less than a year, you have a push from a right-wing extremist group to a hand-picked right-wing extremist judge and shot it up to the Supreme Court to see if we could get a federal restriction on the abortion pill. Don't take these psychos at their word. Don't strike a compromise with them. You beat them. And if the Supreme Court decides that they're going to uh, play this game, you ignore the ruling. As AOC has said, as Nancy Mace Republican has said, Biden administration, do the right thing and prepare yourselves because this is coming. All right, guys, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we'll be joined by Michael Sandel. <laughs> Hey folks, this uh, today's one of today's sponsor is um, a, a product that it came out of a an experiment that I did when a buddy of mine gave me some uh, cannabis seeds, and I planted them, and they grew into uh, big plants. But I didn't sex them uh, properly. Apparently, there's male and female cannabis plants, and um, when you don't sex them. What you get at the end of that process is a bunch of seeds. But uh, my loss, your gain, uh, because uh, my buddy was like, we can sell these. These are great seeds. So if you go to Cedars Seeds, S-E-D-E-R-S Seeds.com, you can purchase a, uh, uh, a packet, six uh, seeds, um, check your local um, uh, regulations. See if you're allowed to do, uh, you know, outdoor growing, uh, you know, your own growing. Some places you can, some places you can't. In New York, you can. Uh, six plants. Um, and uh, check it out. If you use the coupon code SEEDS, you're not only going to get the special majority report 15% uh, discount that we got running right now, you'll also get free shipping. So check it out. Cedarsseeds.com. 
Oh, and use that to, oh wait, use that. You can just put your phone right up that on that. Check it out. We are back. We are back now with Michael Sandel, professor of government theory at Harvard University, author of many well-received books, including Democracy's Discontent. And this updated version is Democracy's Discontent, a new edition for our perilous times. Um, it's an update to your, your landmark 1996 book. Uh, Michael, thank you so much for coming on today. It's good to be with you, Emma. I, I, so I, I'm sure you get this question basically in every interview that you do about this book. Like, why did you feel the need to update it? I mean, haven't politics been a pretty quiet since since 1996? <laughs> <laughs> hardly, hardly. <laughs> in 1996, things looked pretty good. Peace, prosperity, the really the apex of faith in the Washington consensus, in the market-based globalization, in the deregulation of the financial industry. And everything seemed on the surface uh, to be pretty good. But one of the main themes of the first edition back in 1996 was that just beneath the surface, uh, there, there were discontents swirling about uh, the democratic future, and in particular, uh, the worry that citizens were feeling a sense that we didn't really have much voice in how we were governed, and the moral fabric of community was unraveling, and the market-based individualist ethic that seemed to animate our politics would not sustain us for long. And I worried that the, the moral void in our public discourse would open the way to uh, to hypernationalism and fundamentalism voices calling to take back our culture emma that was my worry back <laughs> in the mid 1990s well that's aged very well i mean it, it's it what is that like to have some of your kind of most well documented predictions on this front kind of come to pass and watch that train wreck in slow motion. I mean, it's not just the United States. That consensus right. of neoliberalism and globalization that you describe is also foundational in what we saw in Brexit. It's foundational in what we're seeing in the rise of autocrats on the right, like Viktor Orban, um, like Jair Bolsonaro in Brazil uh, and elsewhere. I mean, you could even say Narendra Modi in India. Like, yes. like the, even from, from a global perspective, too, did you see... Were you surprised at how the scope of a kind of rapid disintegration in faith and democracy and communitarian politics, how global that that was? Well, I, I can't say that I predicted the global backlash against the neoliberal version of globalization and seeing it come to pass. If it's a mixed blessing, I mean, it's it's one thing to. Uh, feel that one's concerns have been borne out by events, but those events uh, are pretty dangerous and frightening for the future of democracy and the prospect of self-government. But you're right, Emma, it has been a global backlash. The heady self-confidence uh, of, uh, of those years, um, I think, First, had a, first kind of come up and with the financial crisis of 2008, when the whole project of and the, and, and put forward with great confidence and even smugness by governing elites and by mainstream economists who were advising the, those elites, uh, that came crashing down with the financial crisis of 2008. But what the same governing elites and their economists brought us was not a fundamental rethinking of uh, the role of finance in a democratic uh, society. Instead, they put the system back together again. And while they instituted some, some protections to try to prevent another systemic meltdown and certain protections for uh, consumers of financial products. We did not have a fundamental debate about the role and reach of markets 
in a democratic society or about the role of finance. And so uh, I think that the anger that came with the bailout, and it was on the right and, and, and on the left, the left we had the Occupy movement, and then the energized Bernie Sanders campaign of 2016. And on the right, the Tea Party movement, ultimately the election of Donald Trump. So the sense of injustice that was held underground in the aftermath of the bailout found expression in politics, and it contributed to the gathering resentments and anger and sense of grievance that, well, that found dark uh, fruition in the election of Trump and Brexit in Britain, as you say, and in many other uh, authoritarian populists in, uh, uh, around the world. So the question now is, can we rethink uh, the, the structure of the economy, reconfigure it in a way that is more amenable to democratic politics and control? I, I it struck it struck me when you know researching your book for for today how you you talk about this concept of of meritocratic hubris among yeah. elites and how it, it really is striking how Trump and the Republican Party were able to really pivot quite quickly and target credentialism as a yeah. as a way to make it seem as if. They're going after elites, um, as you know. Ted Cruz talks about uh, Harvard, Harvard elites, and he went to Princeton and Yale, right? And and like same, DeSantis went to Yale. It's it's so, but but the, their messaging is kind of what really matters on that way. And then it also is a way for them to go after doctors and scientists. So it has the trappings of populism, but none of the teeth of it. And I I. It, 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 as you say, it was a real missed opportunity for the left and the Democratic Party not to feel that moment and understand we have to provide a more robust and uh, and important alternative uh, to this, which is really, I think, where you can see why Trump got elected. Emma, I think that's that's right. What we had with Trump was a kind of plutocratic populism, a faux populism. But it's not enough uh, simply for, for those of us, uh, say, to the left of center, to say how terrible Trump was and to point out the hypocrisy of massive ta tax cuts for the wealthy and for corporations uh, carried out by a supposed populist. It's not enough. It's also important for us to ask the question, what was it? that he was appealing to that, that we missed, that mainstream Democrats and mainstream Republicans missed about the mounting anger and frustration. And this goes to what you were saying a moment ago about credentialism, because part of when along with the widening inequalities brought about by neoliberal globalization were changing attitudes towards success. Those who landed on top during the past four decades came to believe that their success was their own doing, the measure of their merit, and that they therefore deserved the full measure of the bounty the market bestowed upon them. And by implication, that those who struggled must deserve their fate as well. This is the meritocratic hubris, the kind of credentialist prejudice that made many working people feel that elites were looking down on them. And just as you point out, there are people who've been educated at elite institutions who are trying to articulate that same message, the one put forward by Trump. But until until we <clears throat> until we have a kind of more genuine populism that addresses the structure of the economy and the dignity of work i think that the that the suspicion of many working people against credentialed meritocratic elites and professionals and experts will persist 
there's also the fact that along with neoliberal globalization and a kind of credentialist meritocracy came a, a technocratic view of politics, the idea that we're beyond ideology now, that it's for experts to determine the shape of the economy, the deregulation of finance, the, the trade agreements that outsource jobs to low wage countries. These were all promoted in the name of expertise, the expertise of economists. And I think that the anger and resentment against those arrangements and against the widening inequalities they produced led to a deep suspicion of experts and expertise. And we saw, we saw the bitter fruits of that during the pandemic when the, the suspicion of expertise extended beyond the economists who had brought us this, uh, into this fix to public health figures and Dr. Fauci and, and uh, those public health experts who were trying mm -hmm. to give advice on how to deal with the pandemic. Yeah, I would say that there's also a uh, the, the kind of secondary effects of that are that people then feel empowered by being their own experts and doing their own research. It's like this democratization of credentialism through online discourse where I've always said that, you know, the conspiracy theories of like anti-vax stuff are a way for people to feel empowered over their healthcare and over their kind of uh, place in society that values that kind of cr credentialism or seems to do so um, in terms right. of where they are at in the economic ladder. And it, it, it feeds uh, a like this insatiable kind of uh, desire to not feel so alienated from our right. politics and our society. And, and it leads people down roads of further alienation as they get into these kind of subcategories uh, through, you know, again, conspiracy theory online. Yes. And, and I think we, we should not underestimate the extent to which this alienation has partly to do with uh, higher education and the role that universities have come to play. Mm -hmm. Not only did they produce the experts who gave us with great confidence, the version of market-driven, finance-driven uh, globalization that led to the widening inequalities. But as, as uh, working people faced stagnant wages in real terms for four decades in the outsourcing of jobs, the mainstream politicians, center right and center left, offered the following solution. You remember what they said, if you wanna compete and win in the global economy, go to university, get a college degree. Mm. What you earn will depend on what you learn. You can make it if you try. This is what I call the, the rhetoric of rising. But there was an insult implicit in that rhetoric. The insult was this, if you're struggling in the new economy and you don't have a college degree, your failure must be your fault. That's the implication. We told you to better yourself, to go to college so that you too could compete in the economy that we designed. But the problem is most, most people don't have a four year college degree. Most Americans don't. Um, nearly uh, over 60% do not. So it was folly to create an economy that set as a necessary condition for dignified work and a decent life a college degree that most people don't have. So this is one of the ways in which uh, uh, those mainstream politicians created the, the resentment and also the backlash, not only against elites, but against universities who have now become a target for many on, on the right. For um, uh, And I think it, it's because of the role universities and the promise that a college education would be your way of contending with the inequality we created that has led to a lot of that anger. Yeah, and then that, that same party kind of, uh, and, and frankly the Democrats are not good on this either, ha have, yeah. have not created any kind of bridge to make education, higher education, 
more accessible to people. I mean, right now the student loan cancellation is tied up in court, but should have canceled all of it. I mean, and then that's, I guess, on the back end. But still, you look at some of what the cost of what paying for college would be, and it's peanuts compared to what the federal government pays for in terms of a free college program on military increases on a yearly basis. So that's a bit of an aside. But I... I you... But could I pick up on, on sure, that aside, sure. which is important, Emma, which yeah. is we also have to pay attention to the full range of educational opportunities that we as a country are supporting. An economist at Brookings uh, compared the amount we spend helping people go to uh, four-year colleges with the amount we spend on supporting community colleges and technical and vocational training centers. And she found that we spend, this was some a few years ago, $164 billion helping students go to college. That's a good thing. But only $1.1 billion on community colleges and vocational and technical training. This is a vast disproportion, which really reflects the neglect of the educational uh, institutions where most, uh, most of our fellow citizens prepare themselves for the world of work and for that matter of citizenship. So this too reflects, this neglect reflects a kind of credentialist prejudice that is deeply at odds with the dignity of work, which I think should be should be the focus of progressive politics, focus less on arming people for meritocratic competition and focus more on the dignity of work, making life better for people who contribute through the work they do and the communities they serve to the common good, whether or not they have a four-year degree. Yes. Um, and again, the, the, just to add, the purchasing power of a four year degree is also going down as well. Um, yes. and, and so it's it, it's a bunch of compounding factors. I, I want to return to what you were saying a little bit before, um, or I guess it's connected, but you make a you differentiate between two forms of liberalism in your book. Um, there's procedural liberalism and uh, egalitarian liberalism, which I think is the kind of the the mainstream consensus of what they think a liberal is or what liberalism is. To take our audience through that kind of differentiation, if you don't mind. Yes, it's really a, a contrast, <clears throat> Emma, between two different ideas of freedom. Freedom is a central American value. And we hear a lot about freedom these days, especially by uh, Republican candidates who say Democrats are against freedom. So uh, there is a kind of debate about freedom. But what this debate misses are two conceptions of freedom that I, I discuss in Democracy's Discontent. There is a, a purely individualist idea of freedom. Even you might call it a consumerist idea of freedom that says I'm free in so far as I can get what I want, satisfy my desires, consumer welfare. But this is, this, I try to contrast this with what I would call a civic conception of freedom that says being free in the sense of a consumer having access to the abundance of this country and the economy, that matters. But it's not the only thing that matters, and it's not the only part of freedom that counts. Really to be free is to have a voice, a meaningful say in how we are governed. The civic conception of freedom I describe in the book is the ability to deliberate with fellow citizens about the meaning of a just society and the purposes and ends that we should pursue. And it's that civic conception of freedom, I argue in the book, that's been crowded out by the purely market-based individualist consumerist idea of freedom. Mm. So really, democracy's discontent, I think to address democracy's discontent, we need to revive and reconnect in our politics with the civic tradition, the civic conception of freedom, which means we have to ask, 
what economic arrangements are compatible with self-government and with democracy, which leads to questions about the role of antitrust, reining in big business, including the tech companies, and giving people a meaningful say as citizens, not only as consumers, in how our collective life will be determined. It's so well said, and it really is, I would say, um, I was born in the 90s. I think since the 90s on, the conception of one's citizenship in the United States, even in protest, is so connected to one's consumer consumer choices that, you know, the civic uh, flexing of one's citizenry in like the mid 20th century in protest and in action is so radically different than what my generation perceives of its ability to use its power in in the U.S. in the 21st century, which is so based on consumption that I feel like there needs to be some sort of renaissance where millennials and the younger generation understands how to be civic participants, even if we're so atomized and even if uh, you know, our economic system feels so many layers separated from our practical day-to-day -day realities. Yes, and it's not easy to lean against the forces and the habits of consumerism uh, as exhausting our conception of what it means to be free, which raises the question, well, how, how might we begin to do that? I think we see, and I try to show in, in the book, how in moments in our past, there have been powerful social movements that involve genuine political debate about big questions in a way that gathered people together. The civil rights movement in the 50s and 60s is one example. The movement, the uh, anti-Vietnam War protest movement was another. More recently, the Black Lives Matter movement that uh, gained momentum in the aftermath of the George Floyd killing. These are glimmers of a civic ambition. Um, all involve conflict, all involve struggles for justice, and all involve political debate and argument. So the civic conception of freedom uh, is compatible with disagreement, with pluralism, with challenging uh, existing arrangements. But in these moments, I think we're recalled to an older civic tradition of freedom. And then there are other institutions within civil society we could debate and consider as ways of shifting our civic education away from a purely consumerist orientation. Some have, have proposed, and I have sympathy for it, but I'd be interested to know Emma, what you think, some kind of universal national service program mm. might like be in a Scandinavia, way. right? Well, right. what do you think? Would you would you be sympathetic? I would that? be as long as it's, you know, I'm on the left. I, I would love for it to be civil service. That's not a funnel into, say, you know, the military, for example. I, 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 I have my fears about that. But right. That's honestly, you know, my my grandfather was a was a socialist, and that's what he would tell me when I was a kid that, that it was so much better because my grandma was from Finland. How over there they would require civil service, and and that would bring people a, a better conception of of citizenry. And I'm I've always been sympathetic to that kind of idea. Um, right, but, and it could be broadened beyond military service to include other forms of of service, whether in in. Uh, providing forms of care, the healthcare industry, education, um, the building of infrastructure. There, there are lots of things we need. We need more public investment in general, both in fiscal terms, but also I think in, in human terms and in ways that elicit participation, but also, and this is as important as the projects themselves, that bring people from different backgrounds, different class backgrounds, different ethnic and racial and religious backgrounds into shared experiences, common projects. Uh, because part of, uh, one of the most corrosive effects of the inequalities that have been widening in recent decades is that 
those who are affluent and those who are of modest means increasingly live separate lives. We send our kids to different schools. We, we live and work and shop and play in different places. And this isn't good for democracy. Democracy doesn't require perfect equality, but it does require that people from different backgrounds encounter one another in the course of their everyday lives. Because this is how we learn to, to negotiate and to abide our differences. And this ultimately is how we come to care for the common good. So rejuvenating the public places and common spaces of shared democratic citizenship, I think that has to be part of any attempt to revive the civic conception of freedom that I, I describe and I'm trying to evoke in the book. How much of it, though, is just strengthening our social institutions? Like, no more charter schools. We're not splitting up our, and again, this is kind of wish fulfillment, but if I were to to, to be queen tomorrow, and what what would I determine? You know, no, we're, we're yeah. going to make the, our public institutions as robust as possible. Um, we're not siphoning off public money for a religious school in Oklahoma or wherever they're just, they're making that decision right now. Or we're not, we're, 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 going we're going to have a universal health care system so that the the people are not tether, torn apart by um kind of uh, very individualized private health care experiences i mean to me I, I it seems like that's only part of the equation for you but i i, I think that's such an important part <laughs> well what i do think uh is important is to strengthen public institutions and public provision of essential goods. So uh, the original idea of the public schools going back to Horace Mann was not only to uh, create schools that would be accessible to those regardless of financial means. That was a very important part of it. But he also took seriously the class mixing character of the public schools. And so I think Part of what we have to do in rebuilding the civic infrastructure of a, of a shared democratic life is to make public institutions good enough and strong enough and well-funded enough so that everyone will want to participate in them. So the public schools should be good enough and strong enough so that parents from the affluent part of town will want to send their kids there. And public transportation could be good enough and clean enough and reliable enough so that everyone will want to use it. Not only those who can't afford, you know, private cars or drivers or something such as that. And I would say I would say the same for public libraries, public parks and recreational areas, public uh, uh, workout facilities so that people don't feel the need to secede even from those to uh, enroll in private health clubs. So the health of democracy depends in part on the strength of the public institutions within civil society that not only provide services, but do so in a way that brings us together. It's community building, it's civic education by inadvertence in a way, but over time, when we find ourselves in the same spaces and public places, availing, of our, uh, availing ourselves of services and education and health care and recreation, we come to see one another as fellow citizens engaged in a common project. And that, I think, is necessary to any attempt to bring about a politics of the common good. So yes, I mean I, I, that was one thing I should have added the 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 preponderance of more public spaces. That's n so. I mean, I'm here in Brooklyn and or here in New York. It's just this constant conversation about oh, I don't want to see homeless people on my streets and um, places like coffee shops being cashless because they don't want homeless people using their bathrooms. And it's because we have no public spaces left in this country in many ways anymore. And I think that that is really a lot of what you're talking about here too which is the the financialization of our politics the neoliberal consensus being so hard to break through here 
And I guess that'll be my my real final kind of question is um, what are some of the glimmers of hope that you're seeing in breaking that consensus? Um, because I do think like right now in the Biden presidency, I feel more hopeful that that cons consensus is being broken than I did during the Obama presidency. Yeah, well, that's interesting yeah. because uh, Joe Biden has been around for a very long time. <laughs> And we think of him as, a, and he is a very, uh, he, he's a mainstay of Washington politics over decades. He would be the first to, to say that. And I think there have been some surprising, if not fully announced departures that his administration has made from the neoliberal meritocratic consensus uh, stretching back from the 90s up through the Obama administration. For example, the push for trade agreements that outsource jobs. That seems to have abated. The enthusiasm for deregulation of the financial industry. That's, uh, although I think we haven't gone far enough in regulating uh, finance, that too has shifted. The meritocratic credentialist emphasis. Joe Biden was the first Democratic nominee for president in 36 years with an, without an Ivy League degree. I think this has oriented him at, at least just intuitively toward a greater concern with the dignity of work and the, the future and prospects of people without a college degree. And in his State of the Union, he spoke explicitly about creating jobs for, for those without a college degree and according more respect. So I, and, and also in the elements of public investment, mm. the CHIPS Act, these were departures from the neoliberal yes. uh, framework. Uh, not to cut you off, but to compare that Go to Ob the Obama administration where it was leaked that the that Citigroup was helping kind of staff his cabinet. I mean, like th there, it, he, Biden at least has a reflexive kind of distaste for that that mentality that you describe, which I think it is different. I yeah. think this does represent a departure. What hasn't happened yet, and I would also add um, strengthening antitrust action, not only for the sake of lower consumer prices, but also for the sake of uh, dealing with unaccountable economic power, including in the tech industry. That is another gesture toward what I call in democracy's, consent, uh, democracy's discontent, the political economy of citizenship. It's a reach back to that older civic tradition of antitrust. And we've seen that too in the Biden administration. What's missing is a, a full articulation of a new governing public philosophy that acknowledges the failure of the neoliberal market-driven version of globalization, that economic orthodoxy, that acknowledges that the Democratic Party, as well as the Republican Party, was responsible for that and for the widening inequalities it produced, including inequalities of esteem and respect, and a clear public philosophy that aims at a politics of the common good, that aims at the dignity of work, that aims at rebuilding the civic infrastructure, as we've been discussing, of a shared democratic life. We, we need, I think, the kind of political leadership that could articulate the new directions that are implicit, and I think you're right to identify them, implicit in some of the departures from that economic market-driven orthodoxy uh, that we saw prior to the Biden administration. And in a way, uh, one, of, one of my reasons for writing this updated version of democracy's discontent, a new edition for our perilous times, is to try to uh, contribute to the articulation of a new progressive governing philosophy that can, uh, can recall us to this older, but more inspiring, I think, civic understanding of freedom and of citizenship.
Well, um, Michael Sandel, uh, the book is Democracy D- Discontent, a new edition for our perilous times. Um, it was written in 1996 or came out then, and it's now like just as relevant and you've updated it. So really appreciate your time today, uh, Michael. Thank you so much. Thank you, Emma. Thanks very much. Sure. And we'll put a link to the book in the description for the podcast and on our website and everything. Uh, so appreciate it. Thanks. So. Thank you. All right, folks, with that, we are going to wrap up the first hour of this program. Just one guest today, which is kind of a rarity for me these days. I'm always trying to stuff everybody in that I, I want to hear from because there's just so many smart people out there. But um, great stuff from Michael. We're going to let uh, Brandon and Binder in in a second. But first, just want to say... Uh, Please support the show if you can, if you have the ability to become a member. We really rely on your support more than anything. Join the majorityreport.com. We're an independent show. We're a small operation. And without you guys, we would not be able to do what we do. Um, and just we appreciate you so much. So join the majorityreport.com if you'd like, and then you can uh, send us an IM. That's, I know, maybe they'll get read on air. Who? Uh, some of the many perks of being a member in addition to just supporting us. And um, on ESVN this week, Bradley and I gave our preview of the NHL playoffs. Some of that is going to crap. Although, honestly, the fact that I was I was right about the Winnipeg Jets. I said that they would be a pain in the butt for the Knights, and that's happening right now. Um, I, I mean, the crack can even upset the uh, the Avalanche, too. So... Although the Islanders <laughs> just looks like they don't have a snowball's chance in hell against the Carolina well, Hurricanes. Well, and, and that insane deflected goal was so upsetting. So upsetting. <laughs> I just... mean, poor Islanders fans. I, I think I hate Islanders fans the most just because I, I know most of them. And they're also, they have real little brother syndrome with the mm. Rangers. And yeah, so yeah, for sure. I, I get into real deep arguments with Islanders uh, fans. But Either way, really fun and it starts the NHL playoffs. We also gave our breakdown of the uh, er, the NBA playoff games so far. We're forgetting about game two for the Knicks. YouTube.com slash ESVN show. Keep watching us throughout the playoffs. We'll be covering the NBA and the NHL. And then next week, we're also going to be doing some NFL draft stuff because that is a week from today. So YouTube.com slash ESVN show. Let's b- uh, bring Brandon in. We're still waiting on Binder, but that's my fault because I... Didn't let them know that they had to come in early, but here we go. We have Brandon Sutton, but um, check out Left Reckoning. Don't have the full plug for that, but Bradley is uh, oh, setting uh, up. Oh, yes. Yeah, so we got Brandon here. There he is. Whoa. Hey, Brandon. Can you hear us? You're on mute, buddy. I am on mute. Hello. Can you hear me? I can, but I don't think it's coming through the mic. Um, oh, so hold on one second. Might I think it was very <laughs> ambient. I'll bring I'll bring him back in once he gets it in. Okay. Um, but but, but yeah yeah oh, sorry on left reckoning. Um, friend of the show Cole Stangler came on uh, oh. to to uh, you know to join um, Matt and David to talk about what was going on with the pension protests in France and how effective they've been and why, uh, in Cole's uh, estimation, he thinks Macron is going forward with this type of mm. policy and legislation. So we've oh, had I'm some great, listening to yeah, that. we've had some great conversations with Cole over the last year, I'd say, uh, on MR. So great to see him on Left Reckoning as well. YouTube.com slash Left Reckoning and Patreon.com slash Left Reckoning to access the post game. All right. Well, um, we'll just head into the fun half and we'll fix Brandon's audio and then let Binder in. Check out Doomed. Check out Scam Economy. Check out the discourse. 646-257-3920. See you in the fun half. You are in for it. All right, folks. 646-257-3920. See you in the fun half. Are you ready? Who sent us this? <laughs> alpha males are back, 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 boy is back, and the alpha males are back, back, just as delicious as you could imagine. The alpha males are back, 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 boy is back, and the alpha males are back, 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 back. Just wanna degrade the white man. Alpha males are back, back. I take all of it in my throat. Alpha males are back. Bye.
Snowflake says what? The alpha males are back, 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 back. You are a madman! And the alpha males are back, back. Oh no, Sam Cedar, what a, whoa, what a fucking nightmare. What a fucking nightmare. Can you bring back DJ Yeah, or a couple of them, just put them in rotation. DJ Denner. Well, the problem with those is they're like 45 seconds long, so I don't know if they're enough for the break. Oh, yeah. That's fucking nonsense. See white people doing drugs, they look worse than normal white people, and all white people look disgusting. And the alpha males are psych. Fuck them. Fuck them. Snowflake says what? 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 Hell of a lot of bank. Okay, I'm making stupid money. Hell of, <laughs> hell of a lot of bank. <laughs> a hell of a lot of bank. <laughs> All lives matter. <laughs> Have you tried doing an impression on a college campus? I, I think that there's no reason why reasonable people across the divide can't all agree with this. Psych. And the alpha males are back, 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 back. And the Africans are black, 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 black African. And the alpha males are black, 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 black. And the Africans are back, 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 back. When you see Donald Trump out there, doesn't a little party you think that America deserves to be taken over by jihadists? Keeping it 100. Can't knock the hustle. Come on. Fuck them. Fuck them. Things I do for the bigger game plan. By the way, it's my birthday. It's my birthday. Happy birthday to me, Jew boy. I have a thought experiment for you. And the alpha males are back. Back. Africans are black. Black. Alpha males are black. Black. Africans are back. Back. Come on. <laughs> Come on. We are back, turning off the voicemail, and we are joined by Brandon and Binder. What's up, guys? Nothing Hello. much. I managed to be on the right mic this time. Uh, okay, well, yeah, I mean, it does sound a little bit better. It's still a little weird, but I don't know. sound muffled know. a little bit. Yeah. I can pull it closer to my mouth. No, it still sounds muffled. I, there must be something with that room, but it, nothing could probably be fixed about it. Mm. <laughs> all right, well. It doesn't sound like a mic issue. Yeah, okay. I, I, I think you're all right. It, it, it's not too bad. Um, what's happening over on, on the discourse, Brandon, speaking of, of you? Well, I'm in between apartments right now, so I didn't have a chance to do any editing this week, but this weekend we will be back on track, you know, assuming the noise I can do nothing about, as Matt says, doesn't interrupt my productivity. <laughs> All right. Uh, sounds good. And uh, Matt with the haircut also found the time to do two episodes of his two shows. Yes. No, just one. This week. <laughs> this okay, <week>. sorry. <laughs> No, I, on the dark. I, there's a few. There's a few uh, scam economy episodes in the in the works. I need to uh, finish up and get out there. So scam economy's been on a little little break, but it's coming. And trust me, we're gonna go beyond even the crypto stuff. Focus more even on uh, Web three, which we have been doing. But also, I'm gonna be focusing more on even just like uh, AI. The, the current AI hype that you're seeing, which is a lot of crypto people just moving to the next big tech thing. Um, so that's uh, look forward to that coming down the line. But on uh, Doom this week, uh, just last night, I had on uh, Michael Edison Hayden of the Southern Poverty Law Center. And also uh, Hannah Geis made an appearance. She also works for the S uh, Southern Poverty Law Center, SPLC. Uh, she made an appearance later on, too. So I talked with them about um, that trial of Douglas Mackey, a.k.a. the alt-right influencer Ricky Vaughn, who was convicted of spreading uh election interference disinformation and he's facing up to 10 years in prison uh it's a really fascinating case we, we really do get into the intricacies um michael is uh uh for a long time uh been in this uh space you know working on uh these far-right figures 
and we, we we really do get into the details of it. So it's not just like uh, this guy's terrible. He's a horrible person. Like we get into the details of like what could be uh, too much for this guy to face. What he actually did. Um, and you know, dis you know, d d uh, dispelling the right wing misinformation that claims he was just sharing memes. Um, so you know, definitely check that out. It will be up shortly at doomedcast.com. But if you can't wait, it's up right now at youtube.com slash Matt Binder. All right, well, uh, check that out, everybody, and then check us out as we do some clips in the fun half. Uh, let's just start here because I I was energized by this uh, last night, and I think it's just something that our audience should keep uh, track of. Um, not sure if everyone's heard of what natalism is, what it is to be natalist or pro-natalist, but uh, in the case of Elon Musk, it's a billionaire egomaniac who thinks that he has magic sperm that needs to be spread throughout the world to save humanity. So, uh, that, that, I mean, that, that's just, just, just so you guys know, that's where really he's coming image. from. I know. I'm sorry, to, I'm sorry to, to inflict that upon you guys. But the reason that Tucker Carlson is asking questions about this is a whole different thing entirely. Now, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, a little pop-up. But, um... Natalism is a real is it's just a step away really from eugenics, especially when it's coming out of the mouths of right wingers. They're really focused on birth rates. Uh, but frankly, they're focused on birth rates of white people. They don't say that explicitly, but that is the undertone. And this is a part of a theme of Tucker Carlson wanting to build a Victor Orban style political movement in the united states and elon musk's weird fixation with having as many kids as possible in order to save the planet question mark is just a convenient vehicle for that so here we go stupid dumb people talking to each other on fox news tucker carlson's interview with elon musk yes and um and, and I think we just want to make sure that that you know uh, we we have civilization go onward and upward, um, and uh, that's for example why I'm concerned about decreasing birth rates and and um, the fact that for example Japan uh, had twice as many deaths last year as births, so the, the you know, that that's uh, and and they're they're a leading indicator. It's this is. Can, can I say and, and you've you've written a lot and talked a lot about this, but can I just ask you to pause just <laughs> for a parenthetical note? Why is that? I mean the urge. To have sex and to procreate is, after breathing and eating, the most basic urge. Yes. How has it been subverted? Well, it's just the in the past <laughs> we could rely upon, um, you know, so, simple uh, limbic system rewards uh, yes. in order to procreate. Um, but uh, once you have 